Yeah, so the, this quote actually is from uh, Georges Perec, who um, uses the term infra-ordinary to, to talk about the way in which um, things are kind of too familiar. And, and I suppose the, the kind of core of what I'm going to talk about this afternoon is the way in which capital kind of uses familiarity to hide things in plain sight. Um, that being said, I mean, and following what Thora was saying, uh, there is also an underlying sense, which I'm not really going to go into, in which things actually kind of be resist, as Adorno says, being explained away. And, and although um, industry or capital does try to pull the wool over our eyes, if we choose to look carefully at our teaspoons, we do um, see through that. Well, kind of a specific starting point is one of one of Bath's essays, the one about the citron, the DS or DS. And in this quote, I think what he's, I think what he's trying to say is that the the, the sort of smooth perfection of, of the, the citron kind of creates this kind of illusion of something which is kind of naturalised and sort of transcendently <coughs> kind of perfect. Uh, behind which a lot is hidden. Um, and that's really, as I said, what I'm trying to do. To capital tries to persuade us that things are not what they are. Um, now, Bath has this idea of second order signification, which I think is quite a useful way of, and it's certainly, you know, the way in which a lot of this tends to work. And, and this is a kind of classic example. So certainly in this country, we, we, we use the word biro as a kind of generic term for a ballpoint pen. So the, the orders of significant, uh, signification are that you know, there is the thing, the ballpoint pen, there is the descriptive term ballpoint pen. But then we get the second order thing where people say, oh, have you got a biro? But in, order, in doing that, the, the thing is then subsumed under a particular manufacturer's uh, history. And in a sense, the, the actual history of the, uh, of the artifact as a ballpoint pen is subsumed, it's kind of owned by Bic. Um, another example, though, which, which I think is, is equally, if not so, more so interesting, is the term Hoover. Because what happens, certainly in this country, when you talk about Hoover, is that it becomes a verb. So not only is it um, a descriptive term, but the actual act of vacuuming is, is kind of appropriated or incorporated by the manufacturer. Now, I thought from there to just kind of briefly talk a bit about the idea of, of the functionality of things and the different ways in which function is um, analysed. Because in a sense what's happening here is that the very function of things is being appropriated. Now the, the idea of system function is, well in the case of Fred Flintstone's car, it, it doesn't have a system function because he has to push it along. So it's it lacks the system function that a car ought to have, which was that it's a self-propelled vehicle. It's a thing that does something, and that's, it, that's the way it functions. Conversely, proper function, so defined, is, is in a sense the way in which uh, functionality is more culturally defined rather than whether it does or does not do something. So in the case of front doors, the front door of number 10 Downing Street opens inwards. And in this country, or in, in the UK, we normally expect front doors to open inwards. But what's interesting is that I discovered from watching lots of Scandinoir is that in a lot of Scandinavia, front doors open outwards. So I did ask around a bit about this, and as far as I can see, there's, there's no specific reason why that is. It's just that uh, the proper functionality of front doors is that in some countries they open inwards and some countries they open outwards and that's 
In other words, what we expect of things is that they behave in certain ways because that's our kind of... I mean, there's a choice there, but there's a cultural kind of norm or convention, which is what is properly... The point then is that, of course, you can you can kind of go outside of the proper function of something in that it can have system functions and uh, Beth Preston gives the example of using spoons as a musical instrument spoons are not made to be used as a musical instrument it's not their proper function their proper function is stuffing stuffing your face uh, but the but they have a system function that you can use them as a musical instrument right now of course there's a whole other load of stuff that revolves around things in terms of ideas about style and aesthetic and symbolism and so on. I don't personally think you can separate entirely any of these things from functionality. We really stick with doors for a minute. I mean, the design of a door obviously might say a number of different things about what that door is. I mean, the plain blue one is much less kind of pretentious than the sort of Georgian-y, Victorian wooden one. The, the safe door and the vault door, they both are about security and resistance, but they also kind of symbolise it in the same way. Likewise, the portcullis is both kind of something which functions as something which is uh, resistant, and but it's also kind of a symbol of something which is of power, control, and uh, so in other words, I, I, what I want to say is that these other ideas about the meaning of things, about their aesthetic and their style and symbolism, are heavily kind of tangled up with functionality and it's very difficult to separate one from the other. Now, the point is that once you enter the 20th century, just that everything, including all those doors and teaspoons, is made in a factory, it's mass-produced. And when things start to be mass-produced, it changes the nature of what things are. Um, at the same time, that production process is accompanied by the emergence of a huge industry in advertising and marketing. And in the you know in the 1920s, just after the First World War, industrialists began to realise that. Uh, these new methods of production were all very well, but they had to start to develop uh, quite sophisticated ways of selling things in order to uh, essentially kind of um, <laughs> to justify the output of industrial production. Now what happens there is that you start to get into a realm of what we call industrial design. Now, I popped in a picture of a hand axe because the point is that, in a sense, every artefact is designed, even the hand axe, you could argue, is a product of a design, in a sense, of set of choices. What industrial design is about is, well, uh, I suppose there's a number of levels. One is designing things so that they can be mass produced, but the other is about designing things with a view to how you can um, advertise and market them. Oops, wrong way. So, one of the key figures in the history of industrial design is this guy Peter Behrens, who very few people seem to have heard of. Um, Behrens, um, although he was um, independent, did a lot of work for AEG. Um, he set up something called the Deutsche Werkbund in the early years of the 20th century. And essentially what he did was he kind of created this idea of corporate product identity. So he, he designed ranges of products. He designed the, the fonts, the logos, the whole thing. He even designed AEG's factories. It's like a whole package. So the design of things starts to become part, not just of making kettles that are useful as kettles, but making kettles that uh, um, mean that AEG can sell more kettles. Um, Behrens was a pretty influential individual. He taught people like Gropius and Mies van der Rohe and all the people who 
went on to found the Bauhaus, and, and I think you know a lot of their ideas probably came from Behrens, but probably the reason why he's kind of a bit obscure these days is he was just a tad too friendly with Uncle Adolf in his later years. Um, but a hugely influential figure that so few people seem to have heard of. Um, and back to cars. Um, Henry Ford famously said, you know, uh, said that uh, with a Model T Ford, you could have any colour you like as long as it was black. Um, and Ford had a very functional view of the car. Like, he, he wasn't really interested in anything beyond the fact that it, it just did what it did. He wasn't interested in um, marketing. And he stuck with the same basic design for many years. Conversely, Sloan, and particularly Harley Earl, who was the sort of principal designer at General Motors, began to realise that in order to sell more cars, they had to be a bit more clever about it. And they started to introduce these ideas of like the kind of annual model. And there's this sense of styling begins to come in. Now, particularly in the 1930s, you get a lot of people coming into um, the design of products from, from different kind of fields. Uh, I mean, Bel Geddes in particular, his background was in design for theatre and Hollywood, and he comes into designing products. And, and but Raymond Lowy and, and many of the other people of that sort of period equally. So you then get a pencil shape, pencil sharpener that looks like a space. And these guys were, were very much at the core of the, of the, the design of the um, 39 New York World's Fair, which in many, in many ways is kind of definitive. Uh, example of how industrial design had come to um, to incorporate this kind of um, what we would call it a kind of aspirational aesthetic I suppose yeah. one of the kind of pinnacles of this um, trajectory is this thing which is a 1959 Cadillac Eldorado and in a sense, what, what, what I think they're trying to say to us here is that you know, the, what you're buying into here is like the space age. It's like this is a, a, a kind of space rocket or something. Um, William Gibson christened this sort of style ray gun gothic, which I think is quite interesting. Um, but what's also interesting is at the same time as you get this, this very kind of Baroque design developing around this kind of metaphor of, of selling things as being part of the space ages, that you also get, um, uh, certainly in the furniture design, the emergence of this notion of functionalism, which is rather weird. I mean, it goes back certainly to the Stockholm exhibition in the 1930s, not earlier. And, you know, it, it's around us today and in the case of things like IKEA, for example, but um, the whole notion of functionalism is a bit weird in the sense that, um, it, it, in, in a sense, it sells uh, the idea that a particular design is in and of itself kind of functional, um, as if other designs weren't, um, as if something could be kind of purely sort of functional. What I mean. Um, following through on this, the way in which the, the car in particular um, fulfills this kind of um, industrial trajectory, another obscure character is Louis Cheskin. Now, when Cheskin was originally a clinical psychologist, um, rather like um, Watson, who James B. Watson, who also went into advertising from academic psychology. It was Cheskin who who created the Marlboro Man and rebranded Marlboro cigarettes. He also persuaded McDonald's to retain the gold marches and claimed that it had some sort of Freudian significance. Um, but another Cheskin's <coughs> industrial coup was the design or his involvement in the design of the, um, the Ford Mustang. Now, I was saying that the Ford Mustang is so fascinating, fascinating 
because it's kind of sold as this sort of um, sort of sporty kind of sexy car. If you've ever seen, all right, thanks. I'm probably do that. Um, you ever seen the Steve McQueen film Bullet? He goes zooming around um, San Francisco in this Ford Mustang. But essentially, I mean, the Ford Mustang is just like the kind of Monday of its day. What they did was that they they styled it to kind of have this sort of sexy kind of character, whereas in fact it's just an ordinary saloon car. There's nothing special about it. Um, returning briefly, I mean, to the Day S. Um, this is actually a, a kind of modified uh, version of, of the Citroen that appeared in the original Star Trek series. But the thing is that however it's dressed up, the car is essentially a piece of Victorian technology. It's, like, it's, it's, it's not very far removed from a steam engine, basically. Um, but, you know, you put it in one of these packages and, it, and you, you expect it's going to be something. And, and, and in a sense, the kind of illusion that we would all be um, going around in flying cars now is based on the fact that the car is sold in terms of that 59 Cadillac with the fins on it, whereas in fact underneath it's still a steam engine, so it's never going to fly. Um, I'd say Gibson says something quite interesting in, in this quote about computer on the same sort of lines that he was so disappointed by computers that all this clicking and whirring stuff going on inside it and it wasn't a bit like the kind of space age uh, thing he expected although I have to say that you know if you look at your tablet or your smartphone it, it's kind of getting there now but we're not quite we're not quite there um, so for um, for Bart, you know, he says, you know, that cars were like the equivalent of Gothic things, partly because he's saying that there's a degree of anonymity about them, but also because the car was kind of representative of its age. The people who designed the um, Citroen Deus also designed all these others, the, the Traction of Vaughan and the, um, what do you call it? Um, tin snail and what have you um, but the strange thing is that when you, uh, when you look at cars contemporary now apart from these odd ones like the Fiat and the, the Mini most of them are extraordinarily bland you know there's, there's nothing there like the, the Citroen there's nothing there like the, the Cadillac they don't really <coughs> seem to be saying anything much anymore and I'm not quite sure why that is, because in what way are the manufacturers trying to persuade us of something? I mean, one possibility, is, as my partner says, is that you know, a lot of it's driven by um, safety considerations and boring and things like that. Equally, it's also driven by the fact that people are so much fatter, so that you know, the, the Mini now is just this kind of bulbous thing compared to the a very small original design by his own. But I suppose that the other point is that we've kind of moved into a, an era where uh, whereas the, the car was the kind of Gothic cathedral of the 20th century, the car is not really that central to what capital is trying to sell us anymore. It's kind of, whereas it was the defining artefact of of, of, of right, okay, I'm nearly there. Um, it was a defining artifact. It, it's been replaced by the internet. Um, there's an Italian um, quasi futurist called Beppo who points out that, that, that the, the speed that the futurists uh, imagined and embraced in the car has now been replaced by the speed we get from the internet. But the strange thing is that the actual artifacts, the, the smartphones that we use, are all pretty anonymous things. But I suspect that there's quite a bit of going on underneath that in terms of new ways in which, um, well, I mean, you know, just through kind of things like apps and so on, in which we are being sold illusions. But the other point, um, and relating back to um, 
Victorian technologies that it occurred to me that what the internet also does is that it, in a sense, it displaces a lot of the physicality of things. So, you know, your smart right, yeah, I'm there. The smartphone, um, it doesn't have all the whirring fans and things, but somewhere off in some data centre, we've got rows of these huge Victorian fans chuntering away. It's just that you don't see it in the thing that you've got in your hand, and that really is the end of what I have to say. Thank you.